So what we have today is a PMPJS version three sample solution. And so what I decided to do, we do have a, um, Patrick and I did do videos on this sample and the sample is available in the dev SPFX sample repo. So you can go and check it out. I did update it a tiny bit for today's call to just do uh, highlight some other things. And so, so this is a demo you can in general see, but we'll, uh, we'll go through it a little bit, um, <laughs> a little bit more detail. Okay, so this is the sample that I'm gonna show you the code for. Essentially what it does is it looks into the document library and it gets all the documents in the document library and returns the size and the name and the title of the document and then um, I have a button here that updates the titles. And what it essentially does is just um, appends the word dash updated to each name, which is super, like super useful, right? We all wanna be able to do that. So if we click update item titles, it'll go out and do that update and then update the UI so that it shows that the name of the file was updated. And if we go in the document library, it'll show that. The other thing that um, you see here is this little, this extra new thing that says, my name is Julie Turner. And we're gonna talk about where that came from and why in just a second. So that's what we're gonna look at the code for. So let's start and switch over to the code. And so here's our solution. And I'm starting by looking at the package.json. So when you want to use PMPJS, you need to install those dependencies. And if you go to our documentation and look at the getting started documentation, it'll show you how to do that specifically. But I wanted to just point out that uh, for this project, I've included the SP package, which is all the SP SharePoint REST endpoint support. And then I also included the graph one and this is our support for graph calls and this is not in the sample that you'll find on the repository that's why that's sort of new for today and we also added the logging package in v2 the logging package was embedded in the sharepoint package and the graph package but we've separated it out for v3 so that's a separate install now okay so we have our packages installed and it's all running so we know everything is good to go so now we're going to talk about this config file. So one of, there's essentially two ways to, um, that we recommend that you uh, bring, use PNPJS in your solution by one, either creating a sort of a config file like, or a container for all of your PNPJS calls, or that you create a service. I'm not gonna demo a service today. I will say that a service is how I do all of my coding, but that doesn't necessarily work for everything. So, uh, and for everybody and their, and their patterns of development. So that's just my preferred way. But here's one where we're gonna use a config file. And so what a config file essentially is, is it a way for us to consolidate all our imports that we're gonna use in one place. And so what that means is that for each of our libraries, our SP library and our graph library, we have packages of functionality and we blocked them into different imports so that you could just import the bits of functionality that you need for your project, thereby keeping the amount of code that you're bundling in as small as possible. So I've included um, all the stuff that I need for the SharePoint REST calls, that solution did. So we need these baseline uh, SharePoint ones. We are gonna use logging, so our logging package is imported. And then we imported webs, lists, items, and batching, because I'm gonna show you batching. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, as I said, we I included graph. So one of the things I want to point out right now is that if we were just using SharePoint and not using the graph, then this import right here where it says SPFX could just be that. We wouldn't need this additional part here. This additional part where it says as SP SPFX is sort of a renaming. So in the PNP SP package, there is a method for SPFX that in, um, uh, creates the behaviors that we need. Um, we're gonna give it a different label because there is an identically named one in our graph package for instantiating graph context. And so I'm gonna rename that one to graph SPFX because I'm gonna use both libraries. So now I'm creating globals for um, our SharePoint, uh, factory interface and our graph factory interface. And then I'm creating 
two methods here that I'm going to export. So I'm exporting a constant that is get SP. It needs the context, that's the web part context passed into it. And then assuming that the context isn't null, it's just going to uh, create the, uh, the SharePoint factory interface that we need. So we could then call SPFI. We say we're going to use the behavior, the SharePoint SPFX behavior, which establishes our context. So we pass the context to it. And just to illustrate how you can add a chain additional behaviors, we're going to add dot using, and then we're going to pass in PMP logging because we imported that and set our uh, level, our uh, a level for when we want logging to occur. So this is how you chain behaviors together. And if you look at our documentation, you can see a bunch of um, different behaviors that we uh, provide. And of course, you could build your own. So that then sets up this SP object, which is a global. So then we have an identical method for getting the graph context. And again, it's the factory interface. We're using our graph SPFX to create the context for graph, and I'm using logging on that one too. It's the exact same thing. Okay, so let's just ignore that for a second and move over. This is our root TS file for our web part. And in that, in our on init method that we are adding in, because it's not there by default, we're going to add an asynchronous method for on init. And in that, we're going to make a call to our get SP and our get graph methods passing in the context. And so you can see I'm importing those two methods that I exported from my PMPJS config file in so that I can make the call and pass in the context. That establishes similar to how it was set up in v2 that establishes our global context for the sp factory interface and the graph factory interface okay that's the big change from version 2 to version 3 is that those objects are not global anymore so we need to sort of create our own global versions of them okay now that that's done we can just jump right into our root component so this is our root component that we um that does all the work. This is maybe not how I would do it in production. And I want to kind of make that point that this example is purely met as an example. This is not production level code. So don't use it. Don't look at it and go, oh, this is exactly the way I should do it in production. It's, it's not meant to be that. So when we get in here, we have some imports because we're importing from our config file and some other things that we need so that the typings resolve. But essentially, I, uh, I have a state object for my React component. And right here in the constructor, I've created a couple private variables for that SP and graph object because I'm going to use them. I've established them as, as global objects, but I want to use them and I want to get an instance of them. So I'm going to establish a local copy of that graph and SP object by calling get SP and get graph with no context. So that'll just return the object I've already defined. Then in the component did mount here, as soon as the components mounted, we're going to do make a call to read all file sizes. And that's not an asynchronous component. So read all file, I'm not awaiting it. I'm just making the call to it. And so if we skip down through the render to our read all file sizes, this is going to be our first example of how we're going to add another behavior to this because we want to use caching. So what we do to do that is we have um, this SP factory method. And if we pass an existing factory interface into it, what that will do is copy all the behaviors that are already exist on the SP factory and the this dot underscore SP factory interface to the new one we're creating, which will include our context, which means that we have all authentication stuff that we need to use it, as well as the logging that we had added in that original one. So then we're going to say dot using and add caching to it where we're doing a session store. So now we have a new uh, SharePoint factory interface that has caching in it. And so now we can use that to make a call to the list that is uh, where I defined a constant called library name. It's just our document library. I'm going to get the items. I'm going to select just the fields that I need. And because file is one of those expandable fields, I'm going to tell it to expand the file uh, slash length. You actually don't need that. That could be just file there. Anyway, 
once I make that call, then I have that response and I'm going to just quickly clean that up. So I have all those items and I want to make a new object uh, that is a little bit more clean, where if there's no title, I'm going to say it's unknown. If the file length doesn't exist, I'm going to set it to zero. Just some cleanup on those items. And then this is the added thing here. I added a new method here. Again, this is not how you would do this in production. I added a new um, method here where I'm going to load a user. And this is where I wanted to just demo quickly that I can make graph calls here as well. So this load user method, which is asynchronous, is going to just go get the me object from graph. So that's who's the current user and what is their information from the graph. And then I return that back to this user object. And then I set the state for the items that I retrieved up here and the user that I retrieved from the graph. And so that's how I can then update the user interface to have my display name or any other piece of information from the graph about me. Then the other thing that I want to show, let's minimize this up, is go back up to our render method and just show that here's where I'm rendering that display name, but it could be you know, any of, of the other properties about me, including about me, <laughs> and we could render whatever that is in there. And this is where I'm rendering then the items. Now I have that button, if you recall, where I was going to update the titles. So let me come down here and just look at what update titles does. So in update titles, if you think about it, we have a whole bunch of um, elements, items that we retrieve from the document library. And it's not really efficient for us to just call one after another, make multiple REST calls one after another to update each of those items. So in this case, we're going to create a batched instance. So now I'm going to take the SP object. Again, the behavior on this right now, the behaviors that exist on this object are the context for security and logging. So now I'm going to say, OK, this.sp, and then one of our root methods on that is batched. And what that returns is what's called a tuple. And a tuple is an array here with two properties in it, one of which the batched SP is a, an instance of the, the um, SharePoint factory interface, but which with all the uh, extra needed plumbing to do batch requests. And then a second thing is a method called execute. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to just go um, clone our state uh, variable with items in it because we never work on the state variable directly when we're we're doing work like this. So I'm I'm using a little shortcut here to clone that, um, and then I'm going to loop through each one of the items and make a a call. But I'm going to use the batch sp as the call. So we'll do batch sp web list get by title items get by id because i have the id and then i'm going to make the update call where i'm going to set the title to the current name plus the dash updated and then after that i'm going to put the um the result of that onto my res array so this is an array of the updated item results and i'm going to push each of the results onto that so that they're available after and then I'm going to await the execute method. And so when I await the execute method, that uh, launches all that batch request that I created, which will do all of these updates all in one grouped update. After that, I then remember that I added the, um, the results to this item update result array. So that means this result has each of the list items in it. So if I then loop through the results and do the result.item, this gives me a queryable instance of the item. And so the reason we're doing that is remember that when I got the items from the the list originally, I used caching. And so if I made that call again, because it's the same endpoint, it wouldn't know that it um, it wouldn't go get a new version because it's cached. So we'd have to clear the cache, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm just showing you here is that we can use this item result since the batched entry didn't have the caching on it, then this item, is, it, it is not batched, but it can be used to go and fetch the item and ID and title 
from the item so that I can update our items with the new title. And then I can set state, setting the new updated items because I cloned them, so I'm gonna set them back to state and then that will update my user interface. So that is an example of using PMPJS version three in the 20 minutes I was allotted. So there we go. And uh, that is all I have. Um, and I will try to answer questions in the chat unless Vesa wants to drop questions on me like he kind of always does. <laughs> <laughs> no, th th this was good. Um, now, th before Derek actually moves forward, there was a question there from <laughs> Johanna, because we do have time. You didn't take all of the 20 minutes. Yes, See? yes. I'm happy um, to answer questions. Yeah. So this is great for PMPJ snippets, but Going on what Julia said, are there samples available where people can see uh, the production code to make sure that we're structured stuff correctly? So you called out something in here, which was about the craft or something which is not about the production. But no, it's that, just more, yeah. yeah, it's just more the, the structure of the whole entire solution. I would not, first of all, I don't build, I would never build components. And I don't think even if you're doing React hooks, I wouldn't put your PNPJS code in the UX, I really like to do seg segregation of concerns. So any of the React components or um, uh, anywhere you're doing a render of the user interface, I don't think it's appropriate to be making calls to the user interface. I like to separate my business logic out from the UI. So the components, the React components should only be um, doing things that have to do with displaying information and or um, reacting to user input. And th all the business logic should really be put into a separate place. So when I say don't use this as like production code, what I more mean around that is this, the, the structure of the code. Like I just wouldn't put a lot of this logic about reading files and loading the user and updating the titles in the same component file where I'm rendering the UI. That was yep. more what I meant by that. And then the other part about the loading user, I probably would do that. I did it in line with reading the file sizes. I'd probably do both calls at the same time and load them into separate variables. So I wouldn't be, you know, I, I'm essentially forcing a serial path through this. That's why I was sort of saying I wouldn't do this in production. I wouldn't call do a bunch of asynchronous calls and then do the asynchronous call to the loading the user uh, because they don't depend on each other. So there's no sense in waiting for one to finish to do the other, especially when you're writing asynchronous code, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's more what I meant about it not being production code. Does that yep. answer the question better? Makes perfect sense, makes perfect okay. sense. Um, and then we might need to follow up Julie on, on how about if we would actually have a session related on, okay, this is how Julie would write production code because there's a lot oh. of people who would be interested <laughs> in doing that. So. Sure, sure, sure. Those are trade <laughs> secrets though, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Anyway, thank you for, for that one, Julie. Uh, You're Derek. Welcome. Thank you.